Good morning, everybody. Oh, that was fun. I could watch those. Da- I could watch the whole thing all over again. Oh my goodness! I, it occurred to me, watching the kids. You're probably in that group. I hope somebody got a video of it because probably within that group is your next pastor one day. <laughs> and it'd be fun to play the video back. <laughs> but that was neat. Thank you, Nikki, Heather, uh, uh, Mighty, all of you. Oh, you did such a good job. Thank you very much. My goodness. I'm not going to be long this morning because I know you've got kids around and uh, you're, you're, as parents you're going, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? But uh, it's going to be good. I want to touch on something with you though this morning that I, uh, I think it's a concept uh, that always um, t- touches people but it, huh, it's not on? This is not on? I hear it's on. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, it's a concept uh, at Christmas time that always perplexes people, causes them a little bit of be- bewilderment. And it has to do with what I call the greatest miracle of all time. And that miracle is a word that we find used a lot during this time and season called the incarnation. As we open the Word of God this morning, I, I want to ask you to join me if you've got your Bibles in a verse of Scripture found in John, the book of John, one of the Gospels, chapter 1, the very first chapter, looking at verse 1, 3, and 14, and we'll look at it in just a second. That miracle of the incarnation is unquestionably, with all the things that can be said about God's might and God's power and his almightiness, the greatest miracle has to be the incarnation. And what makes it phenomenal is not simply that we love the Lord, like even Pastor Solo mentioned earlier, uh, for sending his son and fulfilling all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Even the Old Testament prophesied of the coming son. A uh, good verse of scripture, one states so clear- clearly, it's almost God speaking to God, if you can imagine. He says, lo, I come in the volume of the book written of me, a body you have prepared for me, O God. And that's one of the marvelous passages in the Old Testament where God is speaking to God and the mystery of the Trinity is woven in there and things that seems hard to put our mind around. And it brings us to the atmosphere in which I want to open the word today. I believe we really live in a society like never before where the idea of God has been so trivialized that in fact these days a lot of people think they're God. That all the God there is is what you stir up in you and if that's all the God there is, how many know we'd be in a sorry state if, if you're the God? Uh, just try though and have some someone stand out there and create something out of nothing, bam, just like that. It, it can't be done. God is the only one that can do that. And the miracle of God's creative power is that he, in the incarnation, now think about this, steps into his own creation, and he does it for reasons, and those two or three reasons are what I want to share real quickly with you today. Three reasons why God became flesh. Now look at, uh, with me, and it'll be on the board behind us here, uh, John chapter 1, it says this in verse 1, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then down to verse 3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then verse 14 says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, all things were made by Him, and the Word became flesh. The story goes that I read once uh, that just north of the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul up in Minnesota, it was Christmas season, Christmas time, the farmyard was all locked up. It was prepared for the blizzard that was coming. How many know Minnesota always has blizzard anyhow? The family had gotten into the home. It was Christmas Eve. It was the splendor 
of the holidays that could be seen in the living room. All the decorations were out, the blazing fire in the fireplace. And the only thing that took away from that atmosphere and took any edge away was the disappointment of the woman, the, the wife, and her daughter who was a college-age student. They thought that perhaps this year would be the year that dad would go with them to the Christmas Eve service. Not because dad was a believer, he wasn't, but because he was a good man, he was a loving father, he was a good husband, and he was a very successful farmer. And they thought because of the sentiment of the season, perhaps he would go with them. And what had happened at dinner time that night, he had said very graciously that he didn't think he would. He told them no. He says, you know, honestly, I've thought about this all day today, but I realized that if I went with you, it would be meaningless to me. There is no way, he said, in the world that if there is a God, it's difficult for me to imagine what in the world he would become human for. Why would he even do that? And this celebration of God becoming one with humankind, it just doesn't work for me. You two go, and when you come back, we'll continue our celebration. Uh, it wasn't a hostile move on his part, but it was a man who could see no reason for believing that God would become human and come among us. And so the wife and daughter, the story goes, left. And it was about 15 minutes later that he is seated in the armchair in front of the hearth, reading the paper, and all of a sudden he hears some thumps against the, uh, behind him, and he turns around toward the big bay window uh, to see what is happening, and there were tiny birds that were flying into the window. And evidently what had happened is they had seen the light, the firelight, and seeking shelter from the blizzard that was coming, the chill, they were thinking, he supposed, that there were, they wanted to be near the fireplace or the light uh, as a place where they could go to get warm. And uh, this man's heart was a little touched by what he saw and what was happening with these creatures. And he went out on the porch and he wondered what he could do to help them find their way to a shelter. And an idea occurred to him. Uh, and he went down off the porch about 50 yards and he went to the barn and he opened the doors and braced both of the doors open uh, of the, of the uh, barn. And he went into the barn and he turned all the lights on and he thought maybe they would see that. And having done that, he went up to the house and hoping they might see the open barn and go to the barn and get warm or whatever. But when he couldn't divert their attention, he went into the house, he got a big blanket and he waved it back and forth in front of the window and, and all that did was scare them, but they still kept hitting the window they wanted in. And he was observing all of this and wishing he could help them. How could I help them? How could I meet their need and get them into a place where I know it's going to be better for them? And, and he thought to himself, if I could just become a bird for a short time, I could help them find their way in. And when he thought that thought, all of a sudden he found he had preached to himself the answer to his question. God became flesh because there was no way in the world humankind could have possibly comprehended him and he came to meet us where we were. Now that passage of scripture we read today begins with this enormous concept of the word. The, the word, by the way, is logos. In our language, it provides the core for many compound words, all which find, uh, end with something like ology, theology, archaeology, all that kind of thing. All kinds of ologies, which are studies of ideas or fields of learning. And the idea in Logos has to do with information, but it's more than information. It's actually, it con it's considered the root of that information. 
about the time of Christ, you may not realize, but there was a philosopher by the name of Pilo had done a treatise on this word logos, and he was talking about the idea that is behind everything in the world, the idea that conceived man, the idea of what life is supposed to be about, that logos had to do with the reason for everything, and that reason is personified or made into a person. The passage of scripture that we read says that the reason behind everything, this is the way it would have been read at the time, it personified God. He was the reason behind it all, and the reason became human so that we, you and I, could understand God a little bit better. That's all it was. The one who brought everything into being. Can you comprehend this? He steps into his own creation. That is an inconceivable proposition. If there is anything that you were to give yourself to thinking about, the miracle of incarnation, God becoming flesh, when you start thinking about it, I tried it this week, it becomes more complicated to your thought than you can actually get, I mean, you can't wrap your mind around it. How the creator could confine himself to his own creation staggers the mind of even the finest thinkers. But God, in his infinite desire to reach us in love, did exactly that. He is able to do that for the very reason that he is God. And while human reasoning, we can't fully get a grasp of this thought, and, and people say they can't understand it, and they always ask me, how I, how can't understand that? I, I don't know, know if that's possible. I always tell them, please allow for the possibility that God is, is, is at least enough bigger than you in every way that you can't figure everything out. Amen. Come on, amen. That's right. Amen. So at Christmas time, we come to the point that there's not anything more precious than the reason we celebrate at Christmas, God coming among us. Coming for any number of reasons, but I want to give you three important ones this morning. The first one is what we just talked about. The word became flesh because, listen, we could never begin to compromise, uh, com uh, comprehend God otherwise. Just as that man wondered how birds could be made to understand there was a place of shelter, the Lord came to uh, us in the same way, infinitely more distant than... <laughs> Do you understand it was even greater for God to come and stoop into mankind than it would have been for that man to turn into a bird? That would have been easy compared to God coming down and stooping into mankind. In fact, there is no place on the scale of any created thing that you could say was elevated enough, or if you are to make it even more simple or less complex, complex think of this. Just the very fact of stepping out of being creator into your own creation is just an overwhelming awesome indication of how much he wanted us to understand his heart. And Jesus came, son of God, and he comes and we see what God is like. We get a chance to get a feeling of what he is really like in the person of Jesus. We know he must be powerful, uh, but when you see that power displayed in the way he displays it, something of his power even touches your heart. In exercises of miracle power, they, did, if you read the Bible, every time there's an exercise of miracle power, they're always benevolent. They're, they're always wonderfully touching. They are not just shows of strength to say, look how big I am, and look how powerful I am, and I can do anything. It, it, Jesus doesn't become some kind of Zeus on Mount Olympus hurling spears and sending flashes of lightning to display his awesomeness. In, in fact, instead we have a God who is reaching out constantly in grace. If you want to see him, look at how children responded to him. Listen, children have an innate sense. They know when they're going to be welcomed into something. That's why predators are so bad, by the way. Children have an innate sense to know when they're welcome. And Jesus was a welcoming person. Now look at I'm not like Jesus, I admit. But I have this thing, sometimes I'll have children all around me. And it's because I enjoy hanging with them. 
I don't want any more grandchildren per se, but I am <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was getting you back for that comment. Do you understand? <laughs> I like being around, and they like being around me. I have a good time because I joke with them. I play with them. I mean, they, they like Sue Hill, too. I, I had uh, Troy's girl and, and my little granddaughter come to me last time I was here and says, do you know where Miss Sue is at? Miss Sue, we want Miss Sue. <laughs> well, okay, we'll go find Miss Sue. Both the girls. We, and I couldn't understand them for about five minutes, but then it came through and... Oh, they wanted Miss Sue because she gives us candy. They pulls candy out of them. <laughs> it's crazy. But that's a guy. He came. Kids loved him. If you want to see what Jesus is like, look in the face of the broken law of God. He who is the word made flesh, the living law of God incarnate. There was no lowered standard on his part. Do you, do you remember the day that the religious people of his time came bringing a woman with them who had violated the law and according to the law of Moses she had violated the law to such a degree that the law required she be put to death for her adultery and they throw her at his feet right there on the temple grounds and they're trying to catch him Moses' law, they said, she says she should be stoned. Uh, Jesus, what do you say? It, it was already clear to them that the, the man was merciful. They knew that. But they needed to have a test case to verify that he doesn't respect the law of God. And that's when Jesus said, oh, I, no problem. Those of you without sin, you start the process off. You throw the first stone. <laughs> In other words, he reinforces the reality, reality of the legitimacy of judgment that says, you go ahead and visit this if you feel yourself qualified to do so. If you think you're God, you go ahead and do it. Start it off. The fact is, only one person in the whole universe had the right to execute judgment at that moment, and he didn't make it. He didn't do it. The only sinless person standing there that day, and he didn't want a stoner. After the religious folks left, by the way, you remember, in shame, having been called out, he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she replied, well, there's no one left here. And he says to her right at that moment, I love this about God. Watch. He says, yeah, well, I don't condemn you either. And then if that sounds very casual, a sin to you, listen what he says. It isn't. Because then he goes and says, Go and sin no more. Do you understand? He, his coming to be made flesh. He comes, he neither condemns, but he doesn't condone either. He teaches us how his love toward us is. That's what God's like. The word became flesh so we could comprehend with God's, what God's heart and what God's ways are like. In other words, he became flesh because we needed a teacher. We had forgotten how God really worked. The fall of Adam and Eve, it had messed everything up. We forgot God actually wanted to be with us. God actually wanted to walk with us. God actually wanted to speak with us. God actually wanted to communicate with us. God actually wanted to have a relationship with us. And God had to come back into his own creation to, number one, teach us. Aren't you glad that he did that? But here's the other thing that really happened too. We not only needed a teacher, but we needed a champion. We needed someone to neutralize sin's power to destroy. Do you realize you and I, and by the way, nobody's immune, so don't play any kind of fakey games because we're all the same in this room. Every time we let a little bit of, of sin into our lives, we give up turf. It's the best way to say it. We give up yardage. We give up ground. And we needed a champion to help us take back that ground. Yeah. Every time we allow sin in, do you know what happens? Here's what happens. It doesn't just affect 
all the other things as it relates to eternal life and everything like that. That's get it down to where we're at. It puts us in a bondage. And every place in our lives where there's bondage, we needed a God to come back into the flesh and help be our champion to go to war for us so that and by the way he's the only one that can break it amen and go to war for us and break that thing so we can gain back territory that we lost it's a powerful thing to have that happening in our lives man had lost his dominion under God through disobedience and rebellion listen it's one thing to deal with sin, it's another thing to deal with the bondage of sin. Jesus came because we needed a champion. A champion is the king of the hill. He's the one who can beat everybody else. And Jesus is exactly that in our lives. When we come to God every single time, what he wants to do is display for us, I'm going to be your champion in that area that has a grip on your soul and on your heart. And I can break that bondage for you if you'll let me. Wow, he loved me that much. So he didn't only become to be in the flesh to become a teacher. He didn't only come in the flesh to become our champion, but guess what? Here's the third one and then we're going to go home. He came in the flesh because we needed a rescuer. We needed someone to rescue us. Listen, humankind is unable to restore itself without a rescuer. Man had lost his relationship with God as sin separated us and disqualified us. We don't have the ability for self-recovery. There's not a psychologist around. There's not a therapy session you can go to that can help you recover what was lost. We needed a rescuer. And that's what Jesus became. There isn't an, any way. I, I want you to know this. Listen to me real clearly. I'm not going to mince any words. Listen. You can't save yourself no matter how good you are. You can't do it. You don't have the ability to do it. Because if honesty is anything, every time you try, you're going to find out you fall short. And by the way, if we're really honest, the Bible says in Romans that all, say the word all, all, all have sinned and have fallen short. And by the way, it, not that is, that's a past tense thing. You sin today, perhaps. <laughs> and, and perhaps you're going to sin tomorrow. We need a rescuer in our lives. We need someone to come along and rescue us. Grab hold and rescue us and take us. Our, amen? That's what we're needing. And there is, listen, there's no religious system in the world that is adequate to earn salvation. The problem with sin is that it has compromised all of life. All of us are sinners and we need this rescuer. And God says, I love them so much. I am so concerned for them. I see them wanting to do better. I see them trying to get in where it's good and warm and right. But they're beating their heads against the window. And the only way I could lead them to where they need to go is I have to step into my own creation, show them my love, teach them what it, my heart is like, champion for them to bring them out of bondage, and rescue them from themselves and their sin. And that's exactly what he did for us. That's why Christmas is... That's why Christmas time is so important. You and I today, once again, come to this manger, and we got to remember he's a teacher. He's showing us exactly how he loves us. He shows us how to love others. He teaches us so well. He, like I told you before, he doesn't condone sin, but he doesn't condemn he brings that person out. Do you, do you remember the, it just occurred to me, remember the other story? He was so good. When leper came to him one day, he actually,
actually, you, you don't do this in his days. Leprosy was contagious. You touch and you'll get it yourself. Lepers weren't excluded from the village per se, but they had to wear certain types of clothes to let everybody know that they're unclean and you don't mess with that. Yeah, everybody stayed away. And they had to even walk through the village, or walk through the town yelling out the word leper, leper, I'm a leper. And people would stay away. Jesus, oh my goodness, what do you do? You go and do the impossible. God, what are you doing? You touched him. He touched, he reached out and actually touched. Everybody's astounded. He was just teaching them how much he loved. How much he thought toward them. We need the teacher. We need the champion. We need the rescuer. And today, listen. I don't know where you're at, but I need all three today in my life. Pastor Solo is going to come right now and he's going to close this and pray for you and maybe even invite you to put, make a change in your heart. But I want you to understand why the incarnation was so important. God loved you and I so much that he came into our world Stepped out of creation into his creation. Stepped out of his world into our world so that we might have all three. God bless you this morning.